The following stories tell the tales of three soulless hitmen who killed for money. We have a man who has shown nothing but hate all of his life and ultimately took that hate out on hundreds of others. We have an Italian mafia leader organized, planned, and carried out the murders of some major political figures. And finally, we have one of the most infamous, feared, and dangerous Russian hitmen the nation has ever seen. On May 25, 1988, Richard Kuklinski was convicted of multiple murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. This ended 30 years of cold-blooded killing by a master criminal police called the Iceman. Richard Kuklinski is one of the most dangerous criminals we have ever come across in this state. He murdered by guns. He murdered by strangulation. He murdered by putting poison on victims' food. He did all of this at the same time while exhibiting a normal, placid family existence. How many people have you killed? I mean, an approximate guess. Approximate will go more than 100. How do you feel about killing them? I don't. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. Richard Kuklinski was born in New Jersey on April 11, 1935. His mother was Irish and his father was a Polish immigrant who did physical labor on a railroad track for work. Richard's childhood was difficult and violent. The neighborhood where Richard lived was rough and he was often bullied by other kids. His father, Stanley, was an alcoholic who would often viciously not only the children, but Richard's mother, Anna. This was not a matter of pushing and shoving, but of throwing people across the room and beating with closed fists until they passed out. What's the worst beating you ever took from your old man? <laughs> I don't think there's much difference in any of them. They were all pretty bad. He uh, left his mark on me, pretty much. And he did most of that before you were, what, 11? Yes, I was young. It didn't matter if Stanley had been drinking or not. He would take any excuse to beat his children. There were four children in the family, but Richard's older brother, Florian, was often the one that took the most abuse at the hands of his father. Poor Florian was no match for his father. And one time after getting knocked unconscious, the child never regained consciousness. He passed away at the young age of eight. Richard was just five years old at the time. Stanley and Anna forced everyone in the family to lie about what really happened and tell the police that Florian died after falling down a flight of stairs so that Stanley wouldn't get in trouble. But Richard was old enough to know exactly how his brother had died and it made him resent his parents. Anna did little to protect her children from this horrific abuse. In fact, she was abusive herself, and she would turn to religion to excuse her behavior. Over the years, I got to dislike my mother a great deal. But now that I have more time to think about it, she was just a victim of her own life. As a kid, how did you see her? Hateful. Disliked her a great deal. She didn't believe in uh, sparing her out either. I mean, she used to be with a uh, broomstick if I did something wrong. Where would she hit you? Where would she She didn't feel that divorcing Stanley was an option, even though it may have gotten her children away from the danger that Stanley put them all in. She would often leave home to go pray at the local church. I hated my father. If I could have, I probably would have killed him. Probably would have felt good about it, too. My father would beat me just for this, just if I looked at him. He gave me this impersonal feeling I have to when people die in front of me, especially loudmouth people. Loudmouth people remind me of my father. Once a loudmouth person starts with me, I love him. That's the only excuse I need. The constant abuse that Richard was forced to live in had a major impact on his overall development. He was very shy and had trouble socializing with others. He was also very awkward. He got picked on at school and called names. Life didn't get much better as he grew older. His dad ended up leaving his mom, 
forcing her to try to take care of the family on her own. In order to try to fit in at school, Richard would try to be the class clown, but this only got him in trouble with the nuns, who would beat him with rulers. Not to mention that the abuse at the hands of his mother would continue when he got home. His life was pretty miserable to say the least. It was around this time that he began to resent anything that had to do with religion. He believed that if there really was a God, he would not be subject to torment. Richard began taking his inner anger out on poor, defenseless animals. He would kill innocent cats and dogs in the most unimaginably cruel ways. He enjoyed hurting them, and he enjoyed the sounds they made while he tortured them. How were you with animals at that age? Deadly. Cats, dogs. Cats, dogs. I used to tie two cats' tails together. I drove over a clothesline and watched them rip each other apart. How long does it take? Not long. Richard did these things as a pastime because he was bored and claimed he had nothing else to do. Not to mention the fact that he enjoyed it. He was truly a sick individual and it was really only a matter of time until he would move on from animals to people. There was no challenge with the animals. They were defenseless and couldn't put up a fight. He needed something more, something to make him feel even more powerful. When Richard was 14 years old, he was routinely bullied and harassed by a group of six neighborhood teens that called themselves the Project Boys. After being tormented by them one too many times, Richard decided to take revenge. He waited until it got dark and then left his family's home. He then began stalking the main leader of the gang. When he caught up with him, he slammed a metal pole into his head so hard that it killed him. Richard's intentions might not have been to kill the teen at the time, but it was too late. He was filled with a rush of power and control, and he made up his mind that he would never let anyone mess with him again. He packed the body into his car before driving two hours away to a remote location. He chopped off the body's fingers and knocked out all of his teeth before dumping the body in an area of water. From then on, Richard was a changed person. He was never going back to his own life. Fueled with the confidence that he got from killing the first time, he started his own gang and they began running the streets. He named the gang the Coming of Roses and the group went around town robbing stores and stealing from people. He had become feared on the streets. He had money now and he wasn't afraid to throw it off by wearing fancy suits while walking around town. He was obsessed over wanting to kill others. How much would somebody have to humiliate you before you'd become obsessed with killing them? It would be the degree he, he humiliated me. If it were not my, and it would be the time. It would be how my attitude was. If I was jumpy or edgy, it wouldn't take much. If I was passive, then uh, he, he might get away with it. Richard would kill just to kill. It was like he was training to become the most heinous and feared hitman of all time. I took a guy down one time, just following him around. He was with a few people. Now, as they went to the bar, this person decided he couldn't wait to get inside to urinate. He never did. Everybody else went in. He stayed outside to urinate. He urinated. Uh, he went comfortably anyway. He had an empty bladder. But I actually strangled him. From behind, I assume. Definitely. I actually did it in a way that's maybe, maybe this is original. And maybe not, I don't know. But I uh, put the rope around his neck, twisted it, <clears throat> and threw him over my shoulder and held him there. So actually, he, I was the tree hanging him. Yeah. And he eventually just stopped kicking. And I let it loose at one end. He slid down to the ground. I put him over by the garbage and uh, left. The rope that Richard used to complete this murder, he had found hanging from an upstairs apartment right by the bar. It was used as a clothesline. The body was later found in an alley. Richard had a short temper and he had dealt with it by taking people's lives. It didn't take much to set him off and he certainly felt no remorse for how he handled his anger. I was driving in Georgia one time and we were riding down the road and there was a couple of vans running around and they were hooping and hollering there. I guess they were having a good old time and maybe drinking and whatnot. 
finally decided I guess it was interesting to play with a guy from New Jersey. The guys in the car started messing with Richard by trying to ram their van into his car. They ultimately forced him off the road. It's safe to say he wasn't too happy about that. He recognized the fact that he was in a different state and it would be easier to get away with things. So he went to his trunk and took out the only weapon he had on him, his gun. The guys made the mistake of coming up to Richard, apparently not realizing that he was holding a gun. Foolish mistake. They all died, and I didn't even know them. How many? There was a few of them. I reloaded. Killed every last one of them. Yeah. And that wasn't even one I wanted to do. The bodies of these three men were later found along the highway. Richard was long gone. Richard eventually caught the attention of the De Cavalacante family, a known mafia family in the state of New Jersey. They decided to bring him into their group and assign him tasks such as hijacking and mob hits. But before long, they realized the potential he offered them was much greater. Richard seemed to have no soul, no remorse for what he was doing. He was the perfect hitman, and so he was given instructions for his first kill. He gave me a picture of him and um, a description of what he does and what he generally does and where he goes, places he goes. And uh, so I went to the area where they said he might be, and uh, I saw somebody who looked like him, similar to him. He had a knack for smoking, and they told me he smoked big cigars, Churchill cigars or something. This is the person whom Richard was seeking. Richard, riding a motorcycle, went up to the man and approached him. He made a comment about the cigar, but the man did not seem to respond to him well. He turned to Richard and cussed him out. It was at that moment Richard had a clear view of the man's face, and he realized he was definitely the man in the photo. I just took this weapon out and blew his head off disintegrated is uh, like you see a pumpkin get hit with a shotgun or something they just spread out and that's what happened and I light turned green about the time I shot him and I left most people would be disgusted having witnessed something like this. They may become faint or feel lightheaded. They may need a moment to sit and process their feelings, but not Richard. Richard simply went about his merry way. For years, Richard went about his murderous rampage. By the 60s, he was one of the mafia's most important key players. It was as if he was untouchable by the police. One of his most famous murders took place at a bar called Gemini Lounge. This would be the location where members of the mafia were known to go about dismembering bodies. Dismembering bodies, did that turn your stomach? I don't think so. I remember having pizza one day while we were doing something like that. Pizza in one hand, chainsaw in the other? No. <clears throat> I didn't like chainsaws. That's another fable that they've come up with, that I use chainsaws. In. See, chainsaws are messy. Yeah. All you get is little, all over me I have these little pieces of meat. Now that's a pain in the neck if I use chainsaws. Now would I want to ruin a good shirt with a chainsaw? Richard's preferred weapon when it came to dismembering bodies was a butcher knife. He and the rest of the mafia would cut up the bodies of their victims into little pieces, wrap them up, and ship them away. Richard and the rest of the mafia had the process of killing and disposing bodies down to a science. He had every tool in his possession you could think of, from guns to knives, strangulation devices, and cyanide. Sometimes Richard would even freeze his victims' bodies. This was how he earned the infamous title, the Iceman. Richard felt no sorrow for his victims before or after killing them. He was simply following orders. In some cases, his superiors wanted him to make sure that their enemies were not just killed, but that they suffered immensely. He was only too happy to oblige often taking them to remote locations to do the dirty work. I used to have a thing where I would take somebody into a cabin or cave, whatever you want to call it, and I would, uh, I would tie them up or tape them, their hands and their um, feet together, 
And uh, then I would leave them there. And I'd leave a camera on. And um, rats used to eat them. Can you imagine a more horrific way to go than being eaten alive by rats? It's a slow and painful death that would occur in the dark while the person was left alone, simply waiting and hoping for death to come. The first would bite and then more would smell the person and before long there would be tons of them. Richard could then give these videos to his superiors to show them that he did what they had asked him to do. Richard would watch these videos back and he had an unsettled feeling, but he couldn't put it into words. It gave me a feeling of some kind and therefore I was trying to find out what it was that was giving me some type of feeling, but it was the, the horror of what was going on or the screaming that was happening or just the nastiness of it. There were several occasions where Richard seemed to have moments like these, moments where it seemed as if he was experiencing something close to an emotion or humanity, but these moments were few and far between. Because I'm the furthest thing from a nice guy. I am what you call a person's nightmare. One of the most disturbing things about this killer is that on the outside, he appeared to be a normal family man. He was married twice, first to a woman named Linda, whom he had had two children with, Richard Jr. and David, and that he was married to a woman named Barbara, whom he had three more kids with, Merrick, Christian, and Dwayne. To Barbara, he was abusive. He would threaten her and do other horrible things to her, including killing her dog, right in front of her because she came home late. At one point, he even stabbed her, causing her to suffer a wound to her shoulder from which she recovered. Over time, she learned not to ask questions when he went out of town for what he called business, but the children he claimed to love. There was nothing I wouldn't do for my, my children, nothing. I'd kill everybody in this room for them. But despite having care for his children, he hurt them by what they had to witness being done to their mother. Richard would go on to kill well over 200 people, but he could not avoid the FBI forever. By 1982, they were hot on his trail and he was getting sloppy and paranoid. He ended up killing his entire group of men by poisoning them. It was after this incident that the FBI were finally able to get him. It all came down to Richard arranging to meet with a man named Dominic Polyfrone. What he didn't know was that Dominic was an undercover FBI agent, and when he recorded their conversation together, Richard was finally arrested. He was charged with multiple counts of murder, and still, he showed no remorse. He's got to watch too many movies. In court, the victim's families wept as he casually described one of his murders. I, uh... And once in the back of the head. There was no denying that he was guilty. He was ultimately sentenced to two consecutive life sentences, guaranteeing that he would never see freedom again as long as he lived. He had lost everything. His freedom, his family, his life. He was left with nothing, something he was very well aware of. Since there is no love in my life, I must have something to replace it, so I replace it with hate. Constant hate, constant reminder to hate. What's that do for you? Keeps my left foot going in front of my right foot. Keeps me moving. Without it, I would probably just plop down someplace and have no reason to continue. Is that all you've got left is hate? That's all I've got left. Everything that I ever cared for is gone. Everything I ever liked is gone. Everything I that meant anything to me is gone. So hate. That's how you started with, too. Then I've come full circle. It's time for me to die. Richard was hospitalized at the age of 70 due to heart issues. His wife, Barbara, had signed a DNR form, so he ended up dying as a result of his health complications. It would be sufficient to say he was one of the most brutal and ruthless, as well as prolific and efficient killers of the Sicilian Mafia. How does someone become evil like this? We need to start at the beginning, Giovanni's childhood. 
He was born into a family that was already pure mafia. He was born February 20th, 1957 in Sicily, Italy. His father, Bernarda Brusca, was a mafia leader and knew that his sons, Giovanni, Vincenzo, and Emmanuel, would one day take their own spots as mafia leaders. So growing up, he prepared them for their futures. The thought of wanting to be anyone or anything else someday instead of a mafia leader was not even to be considered in the Brusca family. In fact, at one point when Giovanni's younger brother was just a kid, he dressed up as a member of the Coast Guard for a costume party. When Bernardo saw it, he became furious. He tore the costume off the boy's body, destroying it right in front of his eyes. He then slapped the child, warning him to never do such a thing again. Despite the fact that the boys were being raised as trained killers, they were raised in a religious household and Giovanni was even an altar server at church. But behind closed doors, they were taught to become the opposite of anything that Christianity would ever represent. When Giovanni was old enough to officially become part of the mafia, the infamous former mafia chief, Salvador Rina, was in power and even attended the initiation ceremony. Salvatore was a ruthless leader and was behind the deaths of hundreds and hundreds of people. He was familiar with Giovanni, who he had already taken on as an errand boy when he was just a child. Giovanni was killed twice before he was even officially in the mafia. While not much information is known about his first murder, it is known that his second murder took place in his hometown in front of a movie theater. He shot his victim with ease went home to change clothes, and immediately returned to the crime scene. He later said he enjoyed watching as the police arrived at the scene in a panic. He knew he had gotten away with it. By this point, Giovanni was still quite young, but highly trained and knew what he was doing. It soon became clear to all involved in the mafia that Giovanni could be trusted, and they were quite impressed. Not only could he get a job done, but he could get it done well and quickly. He had already secured a firm future. The only thing left to do was be initiated. As part of the initiation process, Giovanni was ordered to pledge allegiance to the family. Salvador instructed him to prick his finger and allow the blood to drop on a holy card. He then held the card while setting fire to it. As flames consumed the card, they recited, If you betray Cosa Nostra, may your flesh burn, as this card is now burning. Cosa Nostra refers to the Sicilian Mafia as pictured here. Giovanni took his new position very seriously, and between the years of 1977 through 1984, he planned, organized, ordered, or personally killed over 100 people. They ranged everywhere from police officers to government leaders and members of rival families. Essentially, it was anyone who stood in the way of the all-powerful Sicilian Mafia. He and his gang used everything from AK-47s to car bombs against their enemies. One of Giovanni's post well-known murders took place in July of 1983 when he targeted Rocco Cinici, the Palermo chief prosecutor. Rocco was known for her noble efforts to bring down the mafia and stop the constant murders that were taking place. He was one of the first in his position to take on this effort, but it was because of this that his life would be tragically cut short when Giovanni killed him with a car bomb. The bomb was so incredibly powerful that the car was catapulted three stories in the air before flying back down to earth. Two innocent people were killed and many others were wounded. This gives you a sense just how much the mafia disregarded human life. Another notable murder that occurred at the hands of Giovanni took place in 1992. This was the murder of yet another anti-mafia prosecutor, Giovanni Falcone. Giovanni had taken Rocco's place after his death and was determined to bring down the mafia. So it was clear why Giovanni and the rest of the mafia viewed him as a threat they needed to eliminate. Falcone knew that he had a target on his back and that there had been multiple different deals they had attempted to arrange to get the mafia to stand off and end the bloodshed. But it was only a matter of time. The mafia utilized bombs planted underneath the road 
to finally wipe out Falcone in 1992. They killed not only Falcone, but his wife and other innocent passengers. It was May the 23rd, 1992, when the judge's car was blown up by a half-ton bomb on a motorway in Sicily. His wife and three bodyguards also died. Falcone's death was a shock to the nation, and many made memorials and did other things to honor the job that Falcone did while he was still alive. The carnage from the massacre was even preserved in a guarded case so others could view it in his memory. Giovanni could not evade the law enforcement forever. On May 20th of 1996, he was 39 years old and living in a modest home off the countryside of Sicily. He was having a meal with his girlfriend, brother, and several other family members. It was a normal day. He likely had no idea that the police had been using cell phone waves to track his location. They suddenly burst into the home and took Giovanni into custody. He couldn't have looked less regal or powerful in a wrinkled shirt and dirty jeans. Those that arrested him wore ski masks as they led him into the station in order to protect their own identities from the mafia. Giovanni decided to work with the police to try to cut a deal for himself. Part of this deal included helping them arrest Salvador Rina. He did in fact help them arrest the mobster later that year. Because he worked with the police, he was sentenced to only 26 years behind bars, despite the fact that he had contributed to countless deaths. You'll be shocked to know that as of 2021, Giovanni was released from prison, but he is not entirely free. He was granted house arrest and is allowed occasional supervised visits from the outside world. Following his release, he gave this interview while wearing a mask to cover his face. Non so dove mi porta, cosa succederà, spero solo di essere capito e è grazie a questa opportunità di poter chiedere scusa, perdono a tutti i familiari delle vittime. Alexander was known as Alexander the Great. He was a Russian gangster who was a pretty notorious hitman for the Russian criminal world. He started out as a member of the Soviet army, but he was quickly kicked out for his violence towards suspects. Alexander Solonik was born on October 16, 1960, in Kurgan, Soviet Union. Growing up, he showed a great interest in weapons, especially firearms. When he completed school, he would become a part of the Soviet army, and would later become a patrolman in training. However, he was kicked out of the program due to showing disrespect to a police officer. He returned home and took a job as a grave digger. He got married and had one child, but the marriage was not long lasting. He would later get married yet again and have a second child, but that would end poorly too. In 1987, he was charged with rape and sentenced to eight years behind bars. Because of his background and who he was, he had a major target on his back in prison, but he was an incredibly skilled fighter who could defend himself against as many as 10 men at a time. This earned him respect from other inmates. He would end up serving only two years behind bars before making his escape. It was then that he started his career as a hitman by joining the local criminal organization. His first hit was the leader of a rival organization. Not long after, he took out mob boss Viktor Nikiforov, followed by Valery Dubichlagi, whom he murdered in the middle of a crowded nightclub, despite the fact that the man was surrounded by bodyguards. Before long, Alexander had become one of the most feared assassins in all of Russia, seemingly always able to avoid police. Anytime they made an attempt to bring him down, he would fight back with gunfire, claiming countless lives. It wasn't just contract killings that Alexander would take part in. He was also very big in the world of drug smuggling and spent a lot of time on the nation's 10 most wanted list. At times, he would even work outside of Russia in other nations particularly Greece. Alexander wasn't ever captured by the police, but instead his life of crime was ended at the hands of another mobster, one that happened to coincidentally share his same first name. He was Alexander Pustolov, and he was an ex-Marine and a Russian hitman. He killed Alexander Solonik by strangling him to death in his own home on January 31st, 1997. There were some myths that he may have faked his own death, but this was later ruled out. The news of the death of Solonik spread quickly, though there was little information at the time of how he was killed. He was 36 years old at the time of his death. It was determined that had he not been killed, he was planning to carry out another major hit in Italy a short time later. 